Leicester has been put back into lockdown following a spike in COVID-19 cases. Work practices in the many textile factories are behind the rise in cases. Almost 300 people have tested positive for COVID-19 at a factory which makes MNS sandwiches. This meat processing plant in Germany, more than 1,300 positive tests have been linked to the factory and 7,000 employees and their families are now in quarantine. In fact, that outbreak's so large that on its own, it's helped to push up Germany's R number. The workplace is the source of infection and the site of spread of infection is being completely ignored. It really is the workplace stupid and they are completely ignoring it and leaving workers at risk, but at the same time managing to blame workers. COVID-19 is an indoor disease. Overwhelmingly, the outbreaks are occurring indoors. It's very hard to make workplaces COVID safe when the infection rate in the general population is so high because the government has done bugger all in getting it down. If you want a strategy to deal with the pandemic, if you want to get to zero COVID so we can open up and the economy can reopen, then workplace safety needs to be absolutely at the core of it. All the information about the aerosol spread and airborne route of the virus is really critical now because that's what's being overlooked because of the need to get people back to work. The air we breathe is important in disease control. If someone emits large droplets near you, they'll also be emitting fine aerosols. When it's really large and we can see it, we call it a droplet. It flies through the air like a mini cannonball and can land on someone who's close to you, in their eyes, nose, or mouth. Aerosols are just microscopic droplets, and they come out of your mouth or nose, and they're small enough that they can remain floating in the air for quite a while. Imagine you're interacting with a smoker. You want to stay as far away as possible from them, really, to avoid breathing in the smoke. The smoke doesn't stop at six feet. Aerosols travel much further, documented up to seven, eight meters, and, and probably even further if the indoor environmental and airflow conditions are right. Singing and shouting generate a lot of aerosols. During normal breathing and talking, 80 to 90% of droplet sizes are actually less than one micron, which is tiny. The very, very small particles are the ones, the pink ones in the diagram, which are getting to the bottom of the lungs, to the deepest part, to the alveolar region. And this is where they can do the most damage. And the more of them that get there, the more severe the infection is. <laughs> Aerosols accumulate in closed settings. If you're in an indoor setting like a hospital ward and there's not very good ventilation, um, transmission is not likely to be a one-hit event where suddenly a droplet comes and lands on your nose and you're infected. It's more likely to be from a result of cumulative exposure to these accumulated aerosols. Ventilation is really important. It disperses those aerosols. Just opening a window actually will have a big impact. We've seen numerous outbreaks with no contact and very high attack rates that suggest airborne spread. The first part of the outbreak, 29 out of 147 workers were infected over a period of about three days. 60% of workers who were within an eight meter radius were infected by that one worker. By the time they'd quarantined the workers from the first outbreak, they'd had contact with other workers in the whole complex. Over 1,500 workers got infected and it led to a lockdown of a large province in Western Germany. That dotted line, anything above it is statistically significant and below it is not. The turquoise big circle at the top shows the outbreak within the factory. And all the other circles are smaller collections of cases within accommodation and so on. The data strongly suggests that the transmission took place within the factory. The outbreak in the choir in Washington back in early March, 53 out of 61 people in the choir practice got infected. Two people died and they spent about two and a half hours in the same hall. It's quite clear from detailed subsequent analysis that aerosol spread was largely responsible for this. This is in a call center in Seoul in South Korea. 94 out of 216 people on the same floor got infected over a period of about five days. The blue chairs are where people got infected. 
Interestingly, there was very little transmission on other floors, and clearly the workers used the lift to get up and down. We know that infection is related not only to viral load, but contact time in the environment of the person who's infected. Contact time is short in the lift. There was one case documented of infection in a person who passed the open door of a patient room multiple times but never went in. There was two buses that went on a trip simultaneously. On one bus, there was an infected person and people on that bus had 40 times the risk of infection. There were cameras on board which showed that there was no contact between people. Coming closer to home, this is the Green Corps outbreak in Northampton. Sudden jump in cases, low level outbreak in the community before that. So clearly had one or two workers going into the factory and uh, airborne spread, propagated spread throughout the factory floor. Very few of the workers are wearing masks and there are a lot of people in the same enclosed space. No windows that we can see. I think the windows in the picture are all internal windows into corridors. The company will not give them sick pay. So yeah. they've got a choice. Do they still yeah. go to work so they can feed their family? Yeah. Or do they self-isolate? The Director of Public Health in Northampton is praising the company for doing everything right and then turning on the workers and saying, they congregated in car sharing, smoke breaks, and in shared accommodation, and then brought the infection back into the factory. Now, it's completely wrong. You would have had to have a great number of infections out in the community to bring that many infections into the factory itself. And what happens here is that the narrative then points the finger at workers. In short, the more indoors you are, the less the ventilation is, the more people that there are, the longer you spend in indoor spaces, the greater your risk. Outdoors, pretty safe unless somebody's literally in your face. Remember, surface spread is still a risk, so it is important to wash your hands. Droplets fall to the ground and they fall onto other surfaces. There can be evaporation of those droplets and then they can become resuspended and become another hazard. Say it's on the bed sheets and you pick up the sheets and give them a shake or fold them, that activity itself can then re aerosolize those particles. Toilet flushing as well is important, and that's been shown to cause massive upward transport of aerosols with virus particles, with 40 to 60% of those particles rising above the toilet seat, leading to large scale spread indoors. And there are also cases where there has been transmission through the sewage and wastewater systems within buildings. Flush the toilet with the lid down, open the windows, turn on the vents and use disinfectant. Unfortunately, WHO, Public Health England and the CDC in America still persist in their official guidance of failing to recognise aerosol spread. When you raise it in the workplace, employers come back and they say, that's not in the guidance. The guidance is not fit for purpose. And this is why hundreds of aerosol scientists wrote to WHO why there's a whole campaign about it. The government guidance on COVID is not right. It actually breaches the Health and Safety at Work Act and a lot of basic health and safety legislation. The whole of the UK, there are only 390 health and safety executive inspectors. Local authority inspectors have been cut from 1,020 in 2010 to 543 in 2017. And it's probable they've been cut further since. So we simply do not have the infrastructure to do the inspections. The health and safety work regulations and everything that goes under them is what actually counts and what we should be going back to. What we have to do is to impose the hierarchy of risk control, and that means risk assessments involving safety reps and workers. The hierarchy of controls, ideally you want to eliminate the risk or substitute, use engineering controls, administrative controls and PPE is the last resort. Right at the beginning of the construction, it was clear that we were going to have issues on the sites. We actually had a higher number of deaths than frontline healthcare workers. When we came out of lockdown, just over 400 construction workers had died in England and Wales. It would have been far greater than that because even those figures, it only goes up to the age of 64. It's well known in construction, you work on past that because you don't have pensions, because you've been bogusly self-employed. On the Monday after the lockdown was announced, images started flooding in of mesh rooms, canteens, building sites, absolutely rampacked. And workers, they're then talking to us as a group that shut the sites, 
and we're starting to link people together then and also through a union and the rank and file construction networks and that's when they started organizing amongst themselves taking action so there's a two-pronged campaign there all workers to be paid and all non-critical sites to be closed that led into the first big site up in middlesbrough mgt where a group of workers came together and forced the closure of the site there was quite a few actually in central london they didn't have a recognized union organization site but they had a workforce that came together and said as a collective we're not doing this in this current situation. In Lambeth we were being told to keep libraries open the government were refusing to make the decision to close libraries and our leaders were refusing to make any decisions so we put an ultimatum to management that if they didn't close uh, the libraries down that we would close them down and we would walk out. We used section 44 to say to the council that we didn't believe our workplaces to be safe and therefore we believed we had a right to walk off the job. We had a unanimous vote to walk out by 11 o'clock that night, the councillor decided to close all of the libraries on full pay. Members in one building of ours were concerned and they had public coming in out of the building. They had union members, but never had a rep. Literally in the morning, they wrote to management with my support to tell them that the social distance could be maintained and the building should close. Within an hour, they'd got the building closed. Within two hours, they'd had a union meeting and elected a rep. So things to happen that fast. In one or two schools, they challenged the decision of the local heads for them to go back in. On one occasion, our members didn't go back in for a few days until they had agreed to some amendments in terms of safety. Unilever had actually closed the site well before the government made the decision to start locking down. We were in close communications with the site lead and all, all the way through it. We're obviously, as we're a research establishment that works across both cleaning products and food industry, we would be a key workforce that had to go back to work so from day one we were engaged with the company we closed areas down that we thought wouldn't need to be used many buildings despite not needing even to be open they remain open they ask cleaners to come to work even though there was nobody in the building we have managed to force loads of employers to put workers on for law we have managed to get people pay the for law when the actually the company was claiming for law but what it wasn't paying to the workers we have members at the University of UCL. At the beginning of the pandemic, they decided to terminate the contract for people to our contract. We forced the university to bring them back and put them on four law. We forced the university to pay extra pay for cleaners at the halls of residence. The Adelphi building, owned by Mancio Ortega, one of the richest men in Europe, there were cleaners going in who should have been furloughed. Um, and we managed to successfully get all of them, but one who chose not to be furloughed. We managed also to get them onto the living wage during the pandemic. That's through having a union that's built up a good activist base and the social media following, and that's gearing up for strike action. If someone's gonna to have to choose between coming into work and being paid or being on statutory sick pay, then they're gonna put their own and other people's health at risk and to come in because they can't afford to. So PCSE's Dying for Sick Pay campaign is saying that this should be a number one priority. Those working in security have the highest mortality rate amongst males of all the occupations. When you look at civil service workplaces, that would include museums and galleries. A lot of the rest areas, changing rooms, are usually in the basement, quite enclosed, no ventilation, no air circulation. We managed to strike an agreement with the Cabinet Office, which awarded outsourced staff security, including in services. Full sick pay if the member of staff in question has to go off sick because of the coronavirus and they need to self-isolate. And also if workers need to shield for 12 weeks, even relates to those who've got caring arrangements and also if their workplace has been closed. That agreement was reached back in April until the end of June, but we managed to get an extension and we're currently in discussions about a further extension. Before the pandemic, we've been fighting for proper wages sick pay, holiday pensions. And now, because of the pandemic, the situation is worse because a lot of employers are taking advantage of this situation. We have managed to recover thousands of pounds in wages from employers. I myself am a representative of work where I have recovered, like in some cases, two, three thousand pounds. UBW got a victory for sick pay at Art Globe Academy during the pandemic. So they now get parity with teachers. MOJ falls well short. They ended up giving two weeks pay after significant pressure and after our members had passed away there.
We've had some successes in Salford. We managed to negotiate what's been termed the Salford offer based on a campaign of, of bringing care workers around us, political lobbying and other approaches. Any social care worker who needs to be off the reasons related to COVID-19, regardless of what social care setting they work in or which employer they work for, would be compensated to their typical average earnings. Not just their contractual amount, because care workers are on 20, 25 hour contracts, but we'll do double that in overtime and in sleeping shifts in order to simply be able to pay the bills. And we're talking about minimum wage workers here. We saw a reduction in the rate of transmission within care homes once that package was in place. That will have saved lives. The really frustrating thing, though, is both in terms of the PPA, the additional staff required to cover for those who went off, and the money to compensate those who needed to go off for reasons related to COVID-19, the public purse had to pick up the cost of all three. The Salford offer is paid for fully by a combination of local authority and NHS money. When it was clear the market was unwilling and unable to get adequate levels of PPE, local government stepped in and coordinated the delivery, even to companies who could have afforded it. Recruitment was handled by Salford Council's internal HR team. Because the council had the capacity and the ability to do it and the private sector didn't. We've got a dispute brewing now in Sage Care Home where they're asking for £12 an hour, a sick pay scheme and annual leave in line with the NHS. They've cut the cleaning during the pandemic so people have lost shifts, the cleaning has reduced, they're being paid 8 72 an hour there, the minimum wage, and there's no sick pay. And there was a 63-year-old woman with diabetes who was the one that was cleaning up the rooms of the residents that had passed away from COVID. Now we're balloting the strike action in that care home. What the pandemic has really brought home is just how difficult it is to operate an effective, safe social care system when it's in the hands of the private sector. It's absolutely incumbent now on the labour and trade union movement to, to put everything we can into resolving this situation in social care. I'm concerned that working from home, your work-life balance is shot because you don't have a cut-off point. We're doing stuff like sending out surveys to ask about their well-being and mental health, temperature checks. People are working from home in economically unsound conditions, so they end up with bad backs. The site safety team issues like laptops, um, screens, seats. There are a lot of engineering controls that can be applied to make environments safer. Unfortunately, we lost about 30 transport workers in London, majority of them bus drivers. We managed to seal the front door of the bus and that forced the companies to allow the passengers to board from the back door instead of the front door. It's a major safety victory that was won to prevent passengers coming anywhere near the bus drivers. The door victories and sanitizers and filling up prospect screens came from workers taking control. The role of ventilation is dilution removal and inactivation of the virus. Most of our workplaces where we have lots of people working indoors have absolutely crap ventilation and have had for bloody years. It has been spread through air conditioning. There have been some recent cases from a Dutch hospital where wards that had recirculated air through the air conditioning system had infections and the wards taking in fresh air without any recirculation. There wasn't any infection. The HSE has been absolutely pathetic on the whole issue of ventilation. The European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control goes through all the things that employers and building managers should be doing. And the Federation of European Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Associations has produced as to the things that employers should be doing and the questions that you can be asking. This is very important. In the DEFRA group, which is the Environment Agency, they've adopted the REFRA guidance and all of their buildings, which we're really pleased about. And hopefully we can go further and get further agreements across other civil service departments. Jacob's Biscuit Factory in Inchy brought in a company to do a series of tests on dust levels. They've said overall there's not too much worker exposure levels. But he then highlighted that a number of control measures were flawed, that things were broken or, or weren't functioning properly, which then completely wipes out the result of the survey. The stewards forced them to bring someone in. So we then demanded immediate action on those ventilation systems and protective guardings being put in place and that's happening at the moment. You can measure carbon dioxide levels as a proxy for ventilation, a level between 600 and 
800 parts per million is equivalent to a well-ventilated room and above that's a sign you've got a problem and the optimum level is about 6.7 litres of air per second per person. Obviously the fewer people in a room the more fresh air there is for those person at whatever level of ventilation. The more people there are the more ventilation you're going to need, the more air changes per hour. Air filtration is important because you can actually get rid of the virus with simple HIPAA filters. And there's also the idea of disinfecting air intakes at source using ultraviolet light. We put safeguards in place, things like screening people when you come in, what questions would be asked, all jointly agreed and implemented. If there's any cases that come in onto site, the rooms are cleared and then there's a big clean down before the next shift can come in. That we know that the rates are coming up. So we're sort of looking now as a trade union group about having a proper risk assessment in place or strategy to empty the site should that be necessary. When people were going off and taking going self-isolation or off ill, companies were bringing in agency workers and a number of them were from Eastern European states. In one of the places, there was about half a dozen of the, of the guys sleeping in their own vehicles in the company car park. So the whole question of sanitisation came into play and we just took the approach, well, everyone needs to be treated equitably here. It doesn't matter where your staff are coming from. Everyone who comes into that building needs to be in that position and looked after the same way. So again, we've responded where issues have raised. If on a risk assessment there are residual risks of infection that can't be controlled by any of the engineering or administrative controls or elimination, then there must be proper personal protective equipment to protect workers. And this is different from the face ready, which are to protect other people from the wearer who may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic but carrying the virus and breathing it out. On average, fitting of masks is about a 50% reduction in exhaled virus, about a 30% reduction in inhaled virus. See, if two people in the same space wear a mask, already you've reduced the amount of virus in the air by about two thirds. If the fit is better, the protection is even better. Don't take your mask off to talk to people, that's exactly the time you need to keep it on because you produce more virus when you talk. And you should wear your mask all the time indoors. As we've seen, aerosol can travel much further than two meters. Personal protective equipment is a mask that protects you, the worker. And if that's needed, that's what you must have. Some masks are better than others. Face shield and masks with exhalation valves shouldn't actually be used. The aerosol pouring out of them. So what we're really looking at are layered multiple control measures. This is a good graphic from Lindsay Marr showing no interventions and it shows the big droplets and small droplets and it shows them in the air and it shows them falling on the ground. It shows controlling the source or having the person who's infected wearing the mask and what that does and it shows what ventilation does on its own and then distance and PPE and then hygiene, and then all the interventions together. We need all these interventions. There's no one magic bullet. You need all of them, and you especially need the ventilation and the filtration. We want all workplaces to be certified before they open. Workers need proof that their employers have made the workplace safer. It means workplaces will open and work without the fear of more lockdowns and more economic and social consequences. And if a precautionary approach is taken, then workers will not become infected at work. There's an army of trained health and safety reps in the UK whose role has been repeatedly been shown to save health, lives and money. Many workers don't have a union in the workplace and we believe that extending the benefit of this role via roving reps as they have done in Scotland, enables employers without safety reps in place to utilise their expertise. And this is a collective response. I think what's going to be important then is that the safety reps and reps are demanding the information from employers, from the public health bodies when clusters occur, from the local authority and from the health and safety executive. Central government's role is crucial because without adequate funding to our enforcement bodies, workplaces and individuals to the sick pay and isolation pay schemes and related social support, then we will continue to see workplaces closing with outbreaks and the transmission of the virus increasing. There's no recognition of racism as an underlying condition of this pandemic. We've been in arguments over individual workers about making sure that the risk assessment takes into account race as one of the factors. But 
that doesn't deal with underlying conditions of why they're more likely to be in precarious employment, why they're more likely to be in jobs which are frontward facing, why they're more likely to be disciplined if they raise concerns about health and safety, be reprimanded by their employer, and less likely to be supported for raising those demands and be given the proper PPE. No employer seems to want to admit that that's a factor in, in the disproportionate deaths. But we all know it is. A lot of workers are working in the in the out for outsourcing employers. They are migrant workers, and those are the people who work for these, uh, you know, as cleaners. They work in hospitals uh, as cleaners as well, as porters. They work as private hand drivers, uh, you know, in the courier industry as well. These are workers that have been considered essential to provide a service, but not as human beings. Union organisation has to go hand in hand with building health and safety because we're not safe where we're strong in unions. How can we expect our communities to be safe? Become a health and safety rep, get organised in your workplace, make sure that you're agitating and organising amongst the members. Know your stuff, understand, make sure you investigate things properly and hold their feet to the fire. It's important to talk to members about the regulations that are in place, informing members about the rights they have. Because a lot of people don't know what are the rights. There is hope if they organise they can fight back. Good conditions come from a powerful workforce that can enforce good conditions. It's going to come down to having a strong union in the workplace. It's going to force management's hands to make workplaces safer.